Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Grandview Children's Centre offers amazing programs for children in Durham Region. The centre is life-changing for many children and their families. So when I heard there are 2,500 children on the wait list, I was shocked. Grandview is in desperate need of an upgraded facility, but this government continues to do nothing and back away. There are 970 children with autism who are waiting for ABI services, and the average wait time at Grandview is 521 days before beginning treatment. The government has an opportunity to make a difference. Actually, the Liberal MPs, MPPs from Durham have written the Premier pleading for investment here. So my question to the Premier, Mr. Speaker, is will the Premier commit question. today to listen to her own members, to listen to the Grandview Children's Centre and get shovels into the ground to help these children with autism because it's the right thing to do? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I want to thank the uh, the member uh, for the question, and also uh, for the members on this side who have been uh, advocating uh, for this uh, uh, this uh, facility <laughs> renewal. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, yeah, thank you. The um, the member opposite has brought up, um, you know, the issue around autism here in the province of Ontario, and the member knows uh, very well that this government uh, has uh, invested, uh, will invest uh, half a billion dollars of additional funding to autism here in Ontario, which is the most historical investment into autism, not only here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, but right across this country and probably North America as a whole. So we're very proud. <clears throat> of the fact that we were able to make investments into uh, our children Answer. here in the province of Ontario, and uh, this investment is historic and it will make a huge difference Thank in you. the system. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier, and, and hopefully I can get an answer from the Premier. It's one thing for the Minister to say that they're making it a priority, but not answer the question about Grandview. There are almost a thousand kids on the wait list waiting for ABI therapy. There is there is a wait list of 521 days per child. And it's one thing to say you're going to make this a priority, but we're not seeing shovels in the ground. We're not seeing commitments of actual dollars to these important projects. And it's not just Grandview in Durham. Look at Yes I Can Nursery in Don Valley West. Yes I Can is going to have to close its doors, and Ontario could lose another 130 precious childcare spaces. It's not too late to save Yes I Can Nursery. This government has the opportunity to do the right thing, whether it's in Oshawa with Grandview, whether it's at Yes I Can in the Premier's own riding. I'm asking the Premier directly, will you provide the Question. funding for these centres so children with autism can have the help they need? Yes or no to Grandview? Yes or no to Yes I Can? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to I want to talk about capital investment into our uh, children's treatment centres here in the province of Ontario. Since 2008-2009, this government's invested over 300 million dollars into capital investments into our children's treatment centres. When the member opposite, the leader of the opposition, is talking about autism and program investment, again, Mr. Speaker, we're talking about a half a billion dollar investment into autism here in the province of Ontario. This is unprecedented. No government in the history of this province has done anything like this government, and we're very proud of our records. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, that half a billion dollar investment will create 16,000 new spaces across the province of Ontario, and we're aiming to reduce wait times so it's six months or less. Um, we're going to uh, create more diagnostic hubs across the province, and we're going to make sure that our children here in the province of Ontario have what they need to be successful. Thank you, yes, Mr. Sir, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and for a third time I'm going to ask the Premier to address this. The government has taken families of children with autism to the court. They've kicked thousands of children off the IBI treatment waitlist. They refused to build the much-needed and desperately needed expansion at the Grandview Children's Centre in Oshawa. And soon enough, this government will be forced to close Yes I Can Nursery in the Premier's own riding. D desperately taking away a service for those children that need it. Mr. Speaker, this government's attack on children with autism and their families must stop. This has been continuous. This has been unrelenting. The Liberals can't take 
back their lawsuits, but they have an opportunity for these two centres, with Yes, I Can and Grandview, to actually offer support. And so rather than government talking points of what they might have done 10 years ago or 20 years ago, what Premier Hepburn might have done, question. I'm going to ask a question to the Premier. Will you fund Grandview? Will you fund Yes, I Can? Yes or no? Don't pass Thank the you. buck. Please answer the question. Mr. Speaker, we're not talking about 10 years ago or 20 years ago. We're talking about today. And there's a big difference between this government and what the opposition opposite has brought forward. We're bringing half a billion dollars of new investment into autism. And Mr. Speaker, he's talking about two separate things. On one side, he's Chair, talking please. about services, and then the other side, he's talking about capital investment. We've made over $300 million in the last several years of new investment, capital investment, into those facilities. A half a billion dollars into the service services for autism That's right. and the member opposite knows Joe that this Dixon. government has done more for autism than any government before thank you mr speaker thank you but you see it please you see it please thank you. new question the leader of the opposition Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Since I can't get an answer on their commitment to children with autism, let's talk about hydro. Last weekend, the Premier acknowledged the hydro crisis was her mistake, a mistake she apparently never saw coming. But as CBC's Robin Erbeck put it, aside from the repeated incessant warnings, there was no warning. She also added, Besides the dozens of reports, years of consumer prices, dire financial warnings, protests over unaffordable hydro bills, there was no way they could have seen this coming. So, Mr. Speaker, when did the Premier realize she had made a mistake? Was it when she learned people couldn't afford to pay, pay for the bills to have food on the table? Was it when she realized the seniors were living in energy poverty? When did the Premier realize she made a mistake? And, Mr. Speaker, for the fourth time. Will the Premier question? answer the question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, you know, the, uh, the member opposite knows that uh, we have worked for, uh, for some time, Mr. Speaker, to reduce costs, whether it's taking the debt retirement charge off people's bills or whether it's putting the Ontario Energy Support Program in place, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's renegotiating the Sam Samsung deal, Mr. Speaker, which takes billions of dollars out of the system, or whether it's making a decision, Mr. Speaker, not to go ahead with new nuclear build, which uh, which actually they oppose, Mr. Speaker. So we have made a number of changes. What I have said, Mr. Speaker, is that the mess that we had to clean up when we came into office under the previous Premier, the mess that had been left by the, the previous government, the electricity system was in disarray, Mr. Speaker. There had not been the investments that there needed to be made, Mr. Speaker. There had not been decision making. So as far back as the NDP government, Sir? where there could have been deals with Manitoba that actually would have bent the cost curve, Mr. Speaker, those decisions were not made. We had to clean up a mess. Thank you. We cleaned it up, and there's a cost associated with it. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Uh, Speaker, back to the Premier. I thought the uh, Premier acknowledged responsibility. She admitted a mistake, and now she's back to blaming everyone except for her government when every report, when it, all evidence suggests, is because of their mistakes. Admitting a mistake is Order. the first step, but this omission is too little, too late. Just ask the people of Owen Sound, whose mayor calls his latest hydro bill, I quote, ridiculous. For 13 streetlight accounts, the city consumed $442 in electricity in a one-month period. However, their total bill was over, hear this, $10,000, nearly $5,000 for delivery fees, over $4,000 to pay for their Liberals' mysterious global adjustment fee. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the Mayor of Owen Sound. Question. That is ridiculous. Mr. Speaker, how can the Premier justify a bill like that? $10,000 when only $442 are used. It's ridiculous. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, in my uh, in my first answer, I talked about the changes that we have made. I talked about the reality that we had a mess that had to be cleaned up, which we have done, Mr. Speaker. And I I say now, as I said on the weekend, Mr. Speaker, that there is more that we need to do. And I take responsibility that uh, that we 
have to focus on people's day-to-day costs, Mr. Speaker. I understand that, and I also understand that the, the changes that we have made and the, uh, the cleaning up of the system and making the system reliable had a cost associated with, with it, Mr. Speaker. So we know there's more that needs to be done. Mr. Speaker, on the issue of uh, municipalities, I understand that there are some municipalities that may be uh, speaking to the opposition, but Mr. Speaker, Member the reality Bruce, is that on that front as well, we have been working to undo uh, an, a burden that was put on municipalities by the previous government. Mr. Speaker, we have been taking costs off the property tax bill of, uh, of municipalities, Mr. Speaker, and we've been doing that because we believe that municipalities needed more room to be able to deliver services. To tune of three billion dollars, Mr. You. Speaker, we've taken off. Those Final Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, how is it an apology when you continue to blame others and take no responsibility? You know, Global News shared a story about a Kingston, Ontario couple and their struggles paying their skyrocketing Chief bills because of the Liberal hydro crisis. The family had been without electricity since August when Hydro One cut off their bill for not paying their bill. Then a generous donor in the neighbourhood paid off that bill. They now have their lights on for the first time in a few months. But it shouldn't take the <coughs> generosity of a donation from uh, a kind neighbour. Too many Ontarians are in this predicament. The, sadly, the government just doesn't seem to care. Will the Premier finally show some compassion, not allowing neighbours to take care of someone that can't afford their hydro bill? And I want not a Band-Aid solution, Mr. Question. Speaker. I want a real solution. And I don't want to hear about a PST rebate that doesn't even cover the clean energy rebate. Will we have real, meaningful Thank changes, you. not Band-Aid solutions? People can't. You see it, please. You see it, please. Order. Order. To the leader, when I stand, you stop. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, I understand why the leader of the opposition might want to uh, deal with an issue like this in a very simplistic way. I understand that. I understand that, that that's a tactic, that's a political tactic. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, is that there are a number of things that are going on at the same time. The reality is that we did need to clean up the electricity mess, Mr. Speaker. The solution that has come from the other side is to do nothing, to not make the changes that were made, not make those investments, Mr. Speaker, and stick with coal, stick with a dirty grid, stick with air that was polluted, Mr. Speaker. That's not a solution. And to, and to not make the investments that are necessary. So we, we rejected that notion. We have made the investments that are necessary. And I know, Mr. Speaker, I know it clearly that there are people in this province who have to pay too much on their electricity Answer. bill. We are going to take the PST, the provincial portion of the HST, off their bills, and we know we have to do more, Mr. Speaker. We're Thank very you. clear about that. Yeah, yeah. New question, the leader of the uh, third party. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Does the Premier believe it's unethical for someone to request or accept a bribe to run for office, even if the law does not specifically address it? Thank you, Premier. Attorney General. Attorney General. Well, Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, speaker, uh, absolutely uh, on this of the I would say this side of the house, as as all members would say that uh, you know any form of uh, of uh, bribery uh, is is unacceptable. Uh, speaker, if the member opposite is asking these questions in 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 light of a case that is ongoing, as as we have discussed before uh, in this matter, that that issue is before the courts, it will be highly inappropriate to discuss the facts of those case uh, or to litigate this case before uh, this house there is a very clear rule of sub judice that exists in this house that uh, that uh uh, 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 warns us that we should not be uh, we should not be dealing uh, discussing the matters that are before a court or a tribunal. And I'll urge again all uh, members of the House Speaker to respect that very important uh, rule. Answer. You have uh, ruled on that as well, Speaker, as, as other speakers, and let the courts uh, pursue the matter. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, a federal prosecutor said the Minister of Energy asked for special treatment so he would resign as an MP and run for the Ontario Liberals. And while Pat Sarbara and Jerry Lougheed have been charged for offering a bribe, there's a loophole so that the person allegedly requesting a bribe or receiving a bribe isn't covered by the law. Does the Premier believe bad ethics are okay if they fall through a legal loophole? Uh, 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 Speaker, again, uh, you know this is a this is a, a matter that's been uh, subject to extensive investigation. Uh, this is a matter where allegations uh, have been made, uh, charges uh, have been laid based on the investigation done. Uh, charges are laid against two individuals, which are not member uh, members of this house, uh, as Speaker. Those charges are now being being prosecuted a, in, in, a, in, in a court of, uh, of law, Speaker. Um, the Minister of Energy is uh, not uh, is not um, uh, has not been charged with anything whatsoever, uh, Minister, and he continues to do do his uh, job uh, in an honourable way uh, in that role, Speaker. It is not appropriate, as I said earlier, to be discussing Answer. this matter uh, in this legislature. This is an active matter, a legal matter. Uh, dealing with two individuals in the course, okay. and we should respect the process. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier and uh, her House Leader insist that everything is okay because the Minister of Energy hasn't been charged. At least one reason, uh, perhaps, that he hasn't been charged is because of a technicality, Speaker, a loophole. It's a basic it's a basic uh, uh, of good ethics uh, not to offer a bribe, not to ask for a bribe, and not to accept a bribe. Today, the MPP for Timmins James Bay is uh, put forward legislation is putting forward legislation to close that loophole and uh, to put voters first. My question is uh, a pretty fundamental one, Speaker. Will the Premier support putting voters first and closing that? Thank you, General. Uh, Speaker, you know, first of all, it's it's um, it's, it's disappointing that uh, what NDP is trying to do uh, is just is just score some political cheap shots, Speaker. When we are dealing with uh, real matters that are before the courts, that deals with individuals uh, who have been uh, who have been alleged uh, to do some serious things, Speaker. It is only appropriate, Speaker, that that matter be dealt with the, uh, within the courts. If the member opposite has a bill, that bill will go through this process, Speaker, that is a part of this House. It will be properly debated. It will be properly consulted. I look forward to participating in that conversation. I look forward to uh, listening to the point of views uh, uh, of the others. But, Speaker, you don't just bring uh, provisions like this and expect that they be passed on a whim uh, in the House when they, have, uh, when they have not gone through a serious analysis Answer. or discussion, when we have not done serious uh, consideration and deliberation, and have heard from people like the Chief Electoral Officer which is Thank a very you. important part of the process. Yes, that's right. New question. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, new question. The leader of the third party. Speaker, my question is for the Premier, but I have to say I don't recall asking for unanimous cons consent for immediate passage of the bill, just whether the Premier actually thinks it's a good idea. Uh, anyways, the Premier apologized to the Liberals on the weekend, although I'm not sure exactly what she thinks her mistake is because, frankly, nothing's changed. She's still planning to sell Hydro One, which will drive up costs even more for the people of Ontario. This is the kind of thing that makes people cynical, Speaker. The Premier's apology gets headlines, just like in 2014, but then she goes right back to helping her friends and ignoring Order. the people of this province. Will the Premier show that her apology means something and stop the sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, what I said on the weekend is absolutely consistent with what we have been doing, Mr. Speaker, which is to, to work to take costs off people's bills. We recognize, I recognize, that the upgrades that we have made in the system, the changes that we have made in the system, Mr. Speaker, to make it reliable, to make the grid clean, have a cost associated with them, and that people are bearing an undue burden, Mr. Speaker. And we are making changes, including taking the, uh, the uh, provincial portion of the HST, which was suggested by many people, but including those people was the uh, the NDP and so that is happening at the beginning of January mr. speaker no matter how many times the leader of the third party conflates the issue of the broadening of the ownership of hydro one with the issue around hydro uh, electricity costs mr. speaker that does not make it so does not make it true the reality is that the uh, the hydro one yes, issue is about building 
infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to continue to make those investments that are needed for the economy of this province. Supplementary. Speaker, the people of Ontario can't pay their hydro bills. Who would have ever thought that the people in this province cannot pay their hydro bills. Having your power cut off because your bill has doubled and you can't afford it is the reality for far too many people in this province today. A hollow ap apology to a gathering of Liberals is not going to help those people. It doesn't help anyone except perhaps Liberals who want to feel better about themselves. Will this Premier stop making this about her and her Liberal family and start making it about the people of this province? and commit to, this, uh, to stopping any further sell-off of Hydro One so that the privatization of our electricity system ends once and for all in this province. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that there are people in this province who are having trouble paying their electricity bills, so taking the debt retirement charge off their bills is about them, Mr. Speaker. Creating the Ontario Order. Democracy Support Program is about them, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Uh, putting off new generating projects is about the people of Ontario and the cost that they can bear. Taking 8 per cent off people's bills starting January 1st is about the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Building infrastructure, building roads, Building bridges, building transit, which a previous a previous version of the NDP would support, Mr. Speaker. That's also about the people of Ontario, and we're going to continue to make those investments and at the same time recognize that we have to continue to take costs off people's electricity bills. Both things are necessary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, does this premier know that over 80 percent of the people of this province do not support the sell-off of Hydro One? That's what she should be paying attention to. Ontarians are hurting, Speaker, and everybody knows it. People have lost their jobs because hydro costs have meant that their employers have not been able to keep them on. People can't pay their bills, and they're having to make the choice between groceries and keeping the lights on. Continuing the privatization of Hydro One means that insiders get richer, the friends of the Liberal Party get richer, and more ordinary Ontarians will be hurting. That is the reality of privatization in this province from the day that party started it in the late 90s. Right. Now, how can anybody, anybody at all, take this Premier's apology seriously if she is still helping her friends and making life harder for the people Question. of Ontario by continuing on the wrong-headed path of the sell-off of Hydro One? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the third party wants Ontarians to take her seriously, she's going to have to start dealing with the facts. And the fact is, Mr. Speaker, the broadening of ownership in Hydro One has nothing to do with hydro weights in this province. Absolutely nothing. You've got, to, you've got to be honest with the people of this province. You've got to be factual with them, Mr. Speaker. If you want credibility, you've got to deal with the facts, and that is pure and simple, the facts. We're investing in public transit, Mr. Speaker, because we have the Premier that has the courage to make the tough decisions you need to make to build transit, to build roads, to build bridges. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I've come to the conclusion there's two kinds of politicians Answer. in this place. There's those who talk a big game and those that have the courage to take action and do what they need to do Thank to you. make things happen in this province and build a strong. Thank you. Stop, stop. <coughs> you see it, please? You see it, please? Start the clock. New question. Member from Leeds, Grenville. Speaker, my question is for the uh, for the Premier. The Liberals continue to allow a member of the Legislature who has been accused of seeking a bribe to sit as a Minister of the Crown. This just goes to show you that integrity is a foreign concept when it comes to the Liberal Party. So I wasn't surprised yesterday when the Premier defended 
her Minister of Energy. But maybe the Premier has seen the light. Maybe she's willing to restore the integrity and trust to the Premier's office that Ontarians expect, like it used to be. So I'm going to ask her again, Mr. Speaker, is the Premier finally ready to accept the resignation of the Minister of Energy? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, I was hoping for a moment that the member was standing up to apologize for his behaviour yesterday, Speaker. But uh, seeing as that didn't happen, um, I, uh, I, feel, I feel like I must. I must remind the people opposite speaker about about a particular case that they probably remember it didn't happen that long ago 2009 when the current PC member for Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock resigned her seat and accepted a paid position on the same day uh, speaker the Sudbury Star reported Scott trades seat for head office job the Sudbury Star went on to say PC Laurie Scott was given the job Friday of getting the opposition party ready for the next election in exchange for giving up her seat in the legislature. The Peterborough Examiner, in, the, in exchange for giving up her seat, Scott is taking on the enormous responsibility of election readiness chairman. Supplementary. Ontarians will expect that you to apologize for not asking for the minister to step Chair, aside please. and say the court case is complete. Here, here, here. Speaker, since the Premier is so staunchly defending her Minister of Energy, the same way the Premier defended Pat Cerbera here in the Legislature, I hope she is willing to defend her actions in a court of law. I know she doesn't have to attend or testify in court, and I know the Premier doesn't always do the right thing, Order. but here's her chance to avoid another mistake. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier waive her privilege and appear as a witness? Will the Premier testify? In the trial of Patricia Sorbera. Thank you. Yeah. Deputy Speaker. Well, Speaker, the, uh, Speaker, there's a more, more recent example that I think raises a lot of questions when it comes to the ethical cloud the member opposite speaks about, and it relates to the Scarborough Rouge River by election. Oh, now, Speaker, I think all of us remember the uh, very embarrassing flip-flop, uh, flip-flop, flip. flip, flop, flip of the leader of the opposition on the sex ed, curriculum, uh, sex ed curriculum speaker. So there was a candidate who was very clear about her opposition to the sex ed curriculum. She wasn't flip-flopping at all. She Order. was clear. Her name, Queenie Yu, and she was a candidate in the Scarborough Rouge River by-election. Member from Kitchener-Waterloo. But, Speaker, then what happened in some mysterious Answer. and secret exchange was the PC's top aide sent an email to Queenie Yu, flip-flopping on you. Said the very Thank you. New question, the member from Timmins, James Vick. Thank you, Speaker. I'm not sure what that had to do with the question, but my question is to the Premier. For years, this government has been putting their interests first. Bad ethics are okay as long as there's a legal loophole to get out of it. It's time to close those loopholes. This afternoon, I'll be introducing a bill to put voters first and make it clear that asking for a bribe is just as big as an ethical violation as asking for a bribe. Will the Premier support this bill? Thank you, Premier. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Um, you know, um, the only thing I know about this bill so far is what the the member opposite said in a media scrum, uh, where I believe he wasn't able to answer most of the questions that the media put forward to him. I look forward to looking at uh, reviewing the bill when he gets the chance to table the bill. I'm assuming this afternoon, uh, Speaker. The member opposite has been a long-standing member of this house. So therefore, I know, Speaker, that he knows the process of this legislature very, very well. He knows what it takes to have a second reading debate. I'm sure he's got a slot uh, at some time where he will debate the bill. Exactly. I'm sure there will be a slot when he will debate the bill. I look forward to uh, to uh, being part of that debate. Then, then a matter goes to committee, and then you get to hear uh, from the public. Member knows that a, a, a substantive bill like this needs serious deliberations. 
Chief Government Whip, second time. Supplementary. Well, Minister, you're, you're arguing that this is a, you know, somehow complicated. It's pretty simple. Either it's illegal to accept a bribe or to solicit a bribe. That's all we're trying to do here. There's nothing complicated. It seems to me, and I think it seems to most Ontarians, if it's illegal to put, offer a bribe to somebody not to stand for office or to stand for office, the same should be true as trying to solicit. So I ask you the question again. Will your government support this legislation when we call for the bill to be passed? Will you, yes or no, support it? Thank you. Well, Speaker, I'm not going to determine whether or not I'm going to vote on a bill without even looking at the bill. Speaker, what kind of question is this? You, you, you know, it's a simple bill, it's a simple concept. Show me the bill, let's have a debate on the bill. I look forward to having those, those considerations, Speaker. Process. Speaker, you're talking about a, that, uh, an ongoing process. What the NDP is doing is nothing less than playing politics, Speaker. There are two individuals who are presumed innocent, who are part of the process. They have been no uh, they have been only engaged no in questions. selling no the name of an honourable member of this House, Speaker, and their whole motivation for this bill, what I understand though, so far, by listening to the member opposite, is, 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 to, is to try to sully a member's name even further, Speaker. Shame. Let's have a debate. I look forward to your, uh, to your bill. I'm sure he's, he's yes, got sir. that bill drafted. Uh, sometime soon, Speaker. There will be a debate. There will be deliberation. We'll get to hear from uh, from other people, like the Chief Electoral Officer, on that, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Pitcher Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. We know our government is increasing investments in education all across Ontario, and thanks to those increased investments, graduation rates are up, test scores are up, and more students are attending college and university. And we all know that the Conservatives ran on a plan to make deep cuts to our education system, and many of us remember the turmoil with teachers and the education system when they were in power. Speaker, we reject that approach, and we're taking a different path by making unprecedented investments in the future of students. And those investments are paying off no matter where a student goes to school. Speaker, could the minister please tell this House about how the changes to the funding formula are benefiting rural Ontario schools? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank our brilliant member from Kitchener Centre for that question. Yeah, yeah. Unlike the members of the PC party, we believe that no matter where a student goes to school, they should have all the resources that they need to succeed. And that's why we've made changes to the funding formula to benefit rural Ontario, increased funding to support the higher cost of purchasing goods and services for small and rural school boards, increased funding for transportation, which recognizes the greater distances traveled in rural areas, invested in top-up supports to rural schools to fund the heating, lighting and maintenance costs provided funding for additional principals, even though the local PC member wanted to fire education workers. Finish, please. Speaker, even though the local PC member wanted to fire education workers in their communities, we increased Shameful. our investments to these important rural schools because our party believes that no matter where you go to school, students should have the resources that they need Answer. to succeed. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for her answer. Our government has shown it is committed to ensuring that students in rural Ontario have an equal opportunity for an excellent education. In the 2015-2016 school year alone, this government is providing $3.7 billion in funding toward rural school boards. Again, the Conservatives have an abysmal track record when it comes to education. We've seen the only policy that they want to talk about is sex ed, except they can't even seem to decide where they stand on that. When they were in power, they thought a good education policy was to run government-funded ads attacking our hard-working teachers. Speaker, given this history, can the minister please inform this House? of our long track record of increasing investments in rural school boards, even when the PC members were against it. Question. 
I want to thank again the member Minister. from Kitchener Centre. We've worked hard to make Ontario's education system one of the best in the world. Absolutely. Our graduation rates are at 85.5 percent. Oh, wow. Your question, however, was specifically about rural school boards. So let's look at Leeds Grenville. Let's for look example, Leeds -Grenville. for Leeds Grenville Catholic school boards, funding has increased by approximately 54.5 percent. Wow. And per pupil funding positive. has increased by 73 per cent since 2003. Wow. Since 2003, we've also supported 16 new schools that are either open, under construction, or planned, it leads Grenville? including it leads Grenville? North Grenville District High School, wow. Thousand Islands Elementary wow. School, St. Mark's, Meadowvi Meadowview Public School. Wow. Mr. Speaker, even though the member from that area ran on firing teachers in his own community, we will continue to build Ontario's education. Stop the clock. As I, <clears throat> as I made note the other day, I am concerned that you start talking about somebody else's riding, I will start to interject. I don't like that practice from either side. When anyone declares doing something or saying something about another member's activity in their own riding, stay focused on, on policy, stay focused on the concerns of what you're supposed to be covering. New question, the member from Elgin Middlesex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, cuts. the government continues to ration health care. Yesterday, the Fraser Institute concluded that patients across the country are waiting longer than ever for care, including Ontario. Wait times were up by 10 per cent this year. Surgeries have been cancelled across the province, but the government no longer funds health care 12 months of the year. Mr. Speaker, when will the government properly fund health care and work with our frontline health care professionals to deliver top quality care? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, happy to uh, answer this question uh, with regards to the information that has come out from the PC's favourite institute, I think the Fraser Institute, uh, that uh, specifically looks at wait times across the province. And I'm pleased to say, Mr. Speaker, that overall, when you measure wait times, the Fraser Institute has indicated that we have the shortest wait times in all of Canada in this wow. province, Mr. Speaker, and, and it's really quite exciting, and it shows the result of our investments in uh, wait times, specifically nearly $100 million focused just on wait times this year alone. But the time to get from a GP to a family doctor, for example, to a specialist, uh, we are the shortest in the entire country, 25 wow. percent below the national average. And when it comes to that also important time from specialist to the procedure or the surgery or the treatment that you require. We're the second shortest wait times in the entire country, and 20 percent below the national average, Mr. Speaker. So we're making uh, important improvements. I'm happy to continue Thank you. to address this in the supplementary. That's good. Thank you. supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's nice that the government picks and chooses what reports to look at. But if you look at the Commonwealth report, the Commonwealth report has shown that Canada Order. Please finish. The Commonwealth Fund report shows that Canada is 12th when we can compared to other countries in the world. So the the, pre, the minister is happy with being the best of the worst. The this side of the house wants us to be the best in the world, and they are far from doing so. But wait times aren't the only problem in the health care system. The government continues to grow the bureaucracy to the detriment of frontline health care professionals. Yesterday, the Re Registered Nursing Association of Ontario came out against Bill 41. Question. Last week, the OMA came out against Bill 41. He's burning out our health care professionals. And after all this feedback, the Minister of Health calls the OMA a bunch of liars. Thank Mr. You. Speaker, will the Minister First of all, when I stand, you sit. Second of all, you will withdraw. Withdraw. Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, we were talking about uh, the report he referenced, the Fraser Institute report. So we have, in all of Canada, we have the shortest wait time to get a CT scan. 
We have the shortest wait time in all of Canada to get an ultrasound. We have the shortest wait time in all of Canada to get an MRI, Mr. Speaker. Wait, wait times for general surgery have gone down 13% in the, the last The member for Bruce Grey on sound second Wait time. times for medical oncology from 2015 to 2016 have gone down by 39% in the last year, Mr. Speaker. And elective cardiovascular surgery waits have gone down by 36%, all from the same report that that member happily referenced. Uh, there is more work to be done, but I think we should all be proud of a health care system that's delivering to Ontarians and is the shortest in terms of wait times overall in the entire country. Awesome. And the indicators that I've demonstrated as well, those important indicators yes, in terms of getting to a specialist and getting your treatment, we're the best in the country, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Speaker, thank you. My question to the Premier. Yesterday, in response to our question asking the Liberal government to commit once and for all to clean up the Wabagoon River of the mercury that has poisoned the people of Grassy Narrows, the Minister of the Environment said, and I quote, we will get the cleanup to the satisfaction of the Chief and the health of the people of Grassy Narrows. This morning, Chief Fobister of Grassy Narrows made this statement. Quote, I invite the Premier to put this historic commitment in writing and sign it, along, uh, sign, sorry, and sign it alongside me in proper ceremony so we can know it is real. Yeah. Will the Premier immediately contact the Chief to sign the commitment for cleanup of Grassy Narrows once and for all? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have had conversations with the Chief. I have been to Grassy Narrows, Mr. Speaker, and we, ha we are committed to doing everything in our power. As the Minister of the Environment said, we are committed to doing everything in our power to clean up Grassy Narrows, Mr. Speaker, to take that mercury out of the ecosystem, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we do everything and we are as diligent as we can be and as we have been in other situations like the one that the member for uh, Nickel Belt raised yesterday. Mr. Speaker, that's why there's $300,000 to support water, sediment and fish sampling in the area. But, Mr. Speaker, as I have said many, many times, we are not going to act in contradiction of science that would say that if we take certain actions, we will make the situation worse. We're not going to do that. So, uh, one of the Japanese experts who has recently uh, made a report, Mr. Speaker, Answer. said it is possible that things get worse because of the turning of the soil and the water. Unquote. Mr. Speaker, we will do everything in our Thank power, you. but we will not make the situation worse. Speaker. The minister, sorry, again to the premier. The minister said the Liberal government will get clean up to the satisfaction of the chief and the health of the people. It couldn't be clearer. The people of Grassy Narrows, desperate for help, heard the words of the minister. My colleagues and I heard the words of the minister. The media heard the words of the minister. Again, now that the minister has finally committed, when will the premier? sign an agreement with the Chief of Grassy Narrows, and when will she begin the clean-up of Grassy Narrows once and for all? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. And climate change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think the member opposite would know the significance of what I'm about to say. My colleague, the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, accepted a pipe during a pipe ceremony when he and I spent the day with Chief Favister. If you understand the significance of what it means to accept a pipe from a chief, and both of us participated in the pipe ceremony, that is one of the most profound commitments I have ever seen taken on by a minister. The, maybe you could show some respect, because this is important. Um, and not interrupt. I listen carefully Chair, because please. I think this is an important issue, Mr. Chair, please. So when that pipe was accepted, that is a profound commitment by this government and by two ministers to see this through. As a matter of fact, the Chief has been, and the First Nation has been quite specific yes, in tabling Dr. Rudd's report, which is two pages of actions. More specifically, we have committed to, we are already months into, into fulfilling those commitments and funding it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I know health care is a top priority for our government. 
providing all Ontarians with timely access to the care they need, whether at home, in their community, or in one of the outstanding hospitals, is of the utmost importance to our government, but also to me as a member from Barrie. I know our government increased funding for health care by a billion dollars to $51.8 billion this year. And because of these continued investments in our health care system, we have seen major pro progress in Ontario. Last week, in the fall economic statement, our government reaffirmed our commitment to investing in Ontario's health care system with a brand new announcement of an additional $140 million for hospitals across Ontario. Question. Can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please tell us more about the progress Ontario has made and about the investments we continue to make to provide patients with high-quality care? Mr. Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member from Barrie. And uh, of course, earlier this year in the spring budget, we announced a $345 million investment in our hospitals, Mr. Speaker. And in addition to that, taking the total to over a billion dollars investments in palliative care, in preventive medicine, in mental health, in a whole set of initiatives, including reducing our wait times, Mr. Speaker. And I think it bears repeating the Fraser Institute report that came out yesterday has agreed with us that we're making significant progress in reducing wait times, where we're the best in the country. We're 25 per cent below the national average, and we're first in the country at the shortest wait times for CTs and MRIs and ultrasounds. There's more work to be done, Mr. Speaker, but it demonstrates that that focused investment in our health care system, the more than 2 per cent increase uh, uh, allocated this year alone, that is, that is having an impact which is being seen and felt by patients Thank across you. this province. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that response. I know that all the hospitals across Ontario will be excited to hear that our government is continuing to make important investments that will help patients and their families receive better care and quicker access to services at every hospital across Ontario. These investments will translate to better care for Ontarians, lower wait times, and as a result, improved health outcomes. We all know the Conservative Party has a terrible track record when it comes to health care. When they were in power, they thought good health policy was seeing how many hospitals they could close. Our government is taking a different approach, and we're seeing the benefits of this approach throughout the province. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you inform this House about the investments our government is making throughout Ontario, but especially Question. in rural communities, to improve health care? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we recognize that our rural and small town uh, communities have unique challenges when it comes to the delivery of health services, and I'm proud that I've worked very hard, quite frankly, with uh, all uh, parties, with all members of this legislature, to uh, ensure that that the provision of services, that those programs and services that Ontarians depend on are maintained. Uh, and want, Just to take one example in terms of our commitment, uh, uh, we're working very closely with Brockville General Hospital. In, uh, I know it's in the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the riding of Leeds-Grenville. And As part of that $140 million announcement that was in the fall economic statement that goes to our hospitals, an additional $3.2 million is going to Brockville General Hospital alone, Mr. Speaker. And when you look Look at that increase in addition to the funding that they received earlier this year through the budget and through the LIN. Answer. That's a 15 per cent increase in the hospital funding for that one hospital alone in Brockville, which I know is very important to the member. Thank you. Essex. Question the member from Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Mike Carter owns or operates Food Town, an independent grocery store in Milverton. Mike wanted to reduce his hydro bill. He also wanted to do his part to conserve energy. Doesn't so he participated in Hydro One's small business lighting program to help install energy efficient lighting. But he went further. He also replaced his freezers and refrigerators, a very major investment. My question, Speaker, is pretty simple. Having done all the right things, having invested tens of thousands of dollars to become more efficient, does the Premier agree that Mike should expect a lower hydro bill? Ah, I would think so. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm absolutely sure that the member would have shared with Mike, uh, with regard to his business, that, that he'll be, as of January 1st, getting an 8 per cent cut in his hydro rate. They mock at that, Mr. Speaker, as though six to $800 a year isn't much to a small business. 
six to eight hundred dollars a year if it's around four thousand dollars of his cost which sounds like about right for the kind of business he's running that's six to eight hundred dollars that'll be going back in mike's pocket because of the very important decisions that this government has made decisions that you obviously don't support so maybe you should explain to mike or maybe the member should explain to mike why he doesn't think mike's entitled to that six to eight hundred dollars that our discount is going to provide him Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'm glad the minister brought up the 8% uh, reduction. Speaker, if the, if the Premier had any common sense, the answer would have simply been, yes, his bill should go down. Right. But in Liberal Ontario, it's never so simple. Milverton Food Town lowered its consumption, and because Mike now averages less than 50 kilowatts per month, how did Hydro One respond? They jacked up his delivery charge. They switched him from something called general service demand to general service energy. And the result? His delivery charge more than doubled. All because he's not using enough energy. Right. His overall bill is up 30%, Whoa, and wow. it's not even winter. So, Speaker, I would like to ask the Premier, I would like the Premier to answer Mike's question. And I quote: How do you even question. begin to justify something so stupid? Here, here. Minister. You seated, please. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this, the, the Minister of Energy has taken a number of measures to reduce the costs of power in many different ways within the system, trying to improve the system, looking at more efficient ways of delivering the services, and he's continuing to do that. But what he's bringing forward July 1st is something that's really important to small businesses, to families, uh, and to organizations across this province, an 8 per cent reduction in their energy bills as of January. Mr. Speaker, that's important. That's going to help small businesses like Mike's small business. But on top of that, Mr. Speaker, for those small businesses, we've also gotten rid of the capital tax for Mike's business. We've also, Mr. Speaker, uh, harmonized our, our, the sales taxes. That's saving businesses like Mike's thousands of dollars in administration costs. We've also got a number of issues. We did. We've also reduced corporate capital taxes. Our capital taxes for businesses like Mike's Answer. are now 13 per cent lower than the American average, Mr. Speaker. That's a substantial amount of assistance for our small businesses, but as the Premier Thank said you. on the weekend, we've got, still got more work to do. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Hey, uh, questions for the Premier. In my city of Hamilton, Joanne uh, Prio, manager of Emergency and Community Services, has sounded the alarm bells that homelessness and prevention program uh, has uh, run out of money, in part because of soaring electricity rates, which have created a critical need for programs that help vulnerable people with assistance for hydro bills. Vulnerable people in Hamilton and across the province are paying the price uh, for this uh, Premier's mistake of selling off Hydro One. A vague apology won't save the Homelessness Prevention Program or help pay the bills. Stopping the sell-off of Hydro One and getting costs under control will. What concrete, concrete steps will the Premier, Premier take to ensure that vulnerable, vulnerable people in my community and in communities across this province don't fall through the cracks because of soaring hydro bills? Thank you. Minister of Housing and Responsibility for Poverty Reduction. Minister of Housing and Responsible for Poverty Reduction. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that uh, very uh, uh, important question. You know, Speaker, um, first and foremost, uh, the uh, the manager who uh, has uh, raised this alarm was a very valued member of our uh, of our expert panel on uh, on ending homelessness, and we we really valued her input and the work that uh, she did uh, and, and continues to do uh, within the city of Hamilton. Uh, there are a lot of uh, fantastic programs that the city is running. Our, our government speaker recognizes the moral, moral imperative to end homelessness in Ontario. And as, as part of our efforts to end homelessness, we launched the Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative on January 1st of 2013. CHIPI, as it's called, funds 100 per cent. It's a 100 per cent provincially funded investment. And, Speaker, it aims to improve Answer. access to adequate, suitable and affordable housing and homelessness services. Thank you. Supplementary. 
advocacy organizations around the province, Speaker, like Campaign 2000, are all reporting an increase in child poverty rates. In Hamilton, the connection between increasing poverty and the sell-off of Hydro One and the increasing hydro rates is absolutely clear. And I'm really glad that this Premier's minister values uh, Ms. Priel's opinion. Uh, I will quote her again. Quote, We've basically run out of money. We've had a huge spike in October that we didn't expect in terms of people needing help with their hydro bills. A program, end quote, a program aimed at preventing homelessness in the city of Hamilton has actually run out of money to help vulnerable people because of skyrocketing hydro bills. When will this premier do the right thing for the people of Ontario and stop any further sell-off of Hydro One and ensure the hydro bills come down for the long term and Thank the short term? Minister, I can't hear. Oh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, so I mentioned uh, uh, Chippy funding and, and the Chippy program in the first uh, the first go around. You know, I can say that uh, uh, starting in 2017, we, we've increased funding by 15 million dollars each year for the next three years to that fund, and that's that's an awful lot of money. And that'll bring the total investment in that program to over $2 billion by 2019-20, significant investments that recognizes our government understands the moral imperative to end homelessness in Ontario. Uh, under Chippy, the City of Hamilton, it's, uh, it's received in 2015-16 over $19 million. Uh, that's going up by about $200,000 more each year Answer. incoming. So, Mr. Speaker, it's also important to note that municipalities, they're empowered to choose how those funds are used based on Thank their you. local needs. New question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for women's issues. Human trafficking is a devastating crime and a human rights violation that results in serious and long-term trauma. Some of the most vulnerable poor people in our society are at most risk of being trafficked. It overwhelmingly targets young women, girls and boys, and in particular those in Indigenous communities. It is our duty to act decisively and effectively to protect them from exploitation. I know our government takes this issue very seriously and recognizes the devastating impact human trafficking has on victims and their families. And so, Mr. Speaker, could the minister share with the House what our government is doing to combat human trafficking in Ontario? I know how much it means to the province. Thank you. <laughs> minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for this very important question. Our government is taking strong action to end human trafficking. Speaker, we've listened to experts, service providers, and most importantly, survivors, to develop our groundbreaking and comprehensive strategy on human trafficking. It's a $72 million four-year plan that imposes greater consequences for traffickers, creates stronger protections for those at greatest risk of being trafficked, and provides better supports for survivors of human trafficking so that they are never trafficked again. Speaker, our human trafficking strategy helps not only the girl next door, but women of all ages, racialized, Indigenous women, and even boys, Speaker. We know human trafficking in Ontario disproportionately affects Indigenous communities, which is why we have developed a $100 million long-term strategy yes, to sir. end violence against Indigenous women. We're working hard with a number of ministries on this very important strategy. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you for that answer, Minister. $72 million is really a huge investment to combat human trafficking, and I know that in Kingston and the Islands, the Kingston Police Force is also working on this issue. I'm proud of this government for taking such a strong stance on this issue and sending a clear message that human trafficking is not tolerated in Ontario. Ending this deplorable crime takes the coordination and cooperation of many ministries across government, and that is exactly what we're doing. Mr. Speaker, could the minister go into some further detail about what our government's ministries are doing? And I know it takes a lot of collaboration and, and to build a, an effective framework, what we're doing to build an end to human Question. trafficking in Ontario. Thank you. Minister. 
Thank you, Speaker. The member's right. We have made quite a bit of progress since this strategy was announced just this past June. Uh, our anti-traffic coordination office speaker has been established and our government has named Jennifer Richardson as the director of the new provincial anti-human trafficking coordination office that will be run from the Ministry of Community and Social Services. Uh, Ms. Richardson is an expert in sexual exploitation issues and will bring best practices and lessons uh, from her experience in Manitoba to here in Ontario. As well, the Police College is working with police stakeholders and other experts to develop their human trafficking course. In addition to hiring three victim, with, victim witness service workers, the Ministry of the Attorney General will establish a human trafficking prosecution team with six new crowns. Speaker. We are expanding the benefits available under the Victim Answer. Quick Response Program to better serve victims, and we're increasing funding uh, so that our service providers can better support victims of human trafficking as part of Victim Crisis Thank Assistance you. Ontario Program. So lots going on. Great. Thank you. New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Premier, we've heard numerous stories this morning about how people are doing what the government tells them and trying to keep their hydro bills down. And the Vic Johnson Community Centre in Mississauga a Hockey Arena did just that. They actually spent $40,000 uh, to bring in energy-efficient LED products, new LED lights. It cost them $40,000. They did actually save a lot of electricity. They used 43,500 kilowatt hours less electricity. But did their bill go down, Mr. No. Speaker? Their bill actually went up $23,000 wow. anyway. Speaker, only in Liberal Ontario could you cut your electricity usage by that much and still have your bill go up. Now, I know there's a lot of hockey fans in the legislature. I'm not sure if the Premier is one or not. We have Red Kelly, the Hockey Hall of yeah. Famer, in the House here with us Question. today. But the manager of that facility wants to know I'd like the province to tell us how they're going to fix it. And we all want to know, Thank Premier, you. we heard your mea culpa. How are you going to fix it? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. She flipped the switch. Speaker, we have responded to similar questions like to this in the past, but I, I can't resist, Premier, and I'm sorry uh, to the member opposite. You brought up hockey. Red Kelly was in the House today. And those of us that are old enough to remember will remember when Lanny McDonald, Daryl Sittler, Ian Turnbull, and Boria Salming led the Leafs to the, to the, the Stanley Cup semi, semifinals. But what did they power that on? Speaking of energy and power, what did they use? Something we haven't thought about Pyramid before. Power. Pyramid power. So maybe pyramid power is the answer, Mr. Speaker, to the member's question. Anyway, I just want to let me just close by saying the member's question was a serious one. Some people are wondering what I'm talking about because they didn't follow that. <laughs> The member's question was a serious one. We take it very seriously, and we'll continue to work hard to bring down the price of electricity for those businesses. Answer. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon. Sorry. Too late.